It's a new discovery. How far down? How many meters? 10 or 20 meters. Danger? The first time we go, it's danger. Jeff, when we are on the, on the cave, yes. uh, we go in this. Okay. Okay? Okay. Be careful, it's uh, dangerous. Okay, thank you. I'll be careful. You find a hole in the ground and you crawl down into that hole <laughs> and you're in a different world. We? Oui? Yeah, I'm okay, Francois. I'm safe. I'm just amazed at what's down here. The wall of barbed wire. It's a live rifle grenade. It's a pregnant woman. There's a name, Louis Lefebvre. L-E-F-E-V-R-E. -E -E. Another name by Louis Lefebvre under this heart. These messages left on these walls are notes to the future. These modern people from 100 years ago are talking to us. They're telling us that we are vulnerable just like they were. And World War I gives us a way to look at ourselves without being right or left, with no politics involved, to see our own vulnerabilities, to see how quickly when we lose conscience and human decency as the governing force in our life, how quickly we can end up in a nightmare and lose everything we hold dear. I'm often asked about how I found the hidden world of World War I. It was, like so many things in life, a coincidence. I was on a six-week trip that was arranged with the help of the French Defense Ministry. The result was that I met local people and became friends with them. We bonded around the preservation of this, what they call patrimony, this history. Even though we don't speak the same language, photography is a language, art is a language. The problem was that I had no background in photographing in complete darkness. So I went back to work in the ER in the United States and in between patients, I was reading about how to photograph in darkness. <laughs> There's no book on how to photograph underground. So uh, I, I had to innovate and uh, I ordered basically two of everything. And the first time that I came to the place that we are now, which was the first stop on my return trip, we had something like 700 pounds of gear that we lowered down on a rope almost 30 feet underground. It took about an hour just to transport it by wheelbarrow deep into the site. And that's how the process began. On the walls of these underground cities, you find representations of the inner life of these soldiers in a moment in time when they were facing the first modern mass destruction where they could be gone the next day or the next hour. There really was no other place to go where you could have some sense of security that when a bomb hit above, you wouldn't be blown to smithereens. When the war ended, these guys were anxious to go home and they just left everything in place. All around you, you see objects of daily life. You find tobacco pouches and clocks and pots and pans. And you may pick up an object that a human hand touched a hundred years ago that's been lying in the same place ever since. It's surreal. Looking at World War I, not as history, but as today, as a way of understanding ourselves and our lives, as a way of connecting to what's important about our humanness. World War I was a pivot point where technology and progress overtook our lives. We can never go back. We can never become non-modern. Modernity is with us. Modern life is, is something that gives us great advantages. But World War I helps us to find a place inside where we can hold on to our humanness. And that's why it's important. Thank you. That was part of the uh, exhibit, that uh, the 18 month exhibit at the Air and Space that just finished up a few weeks ago. In the ER, we form intimate bonds with complete strangers in a split second. 
about real danger. It's never right or left, black or white, gay or straight, rich or poor, educated or uneducated. It's just human. Sometimes we must rip off the band-aid and say things that are hard to hear, not to be cruel, but because we care. In the next 20 minutes or so, I want to scare the hell out of you and also give you real hope. I'd like to take you on a brief journey beneath the surface of modern life to see America differently. I believe that as Americans, we are now at war with ourselves. I'd like to challenge each of you to question why and ask what you can do with your businesses to thrive in the chaos. It was the mid-1990s. I was the first fine art photographer to document a hidden world of the Holocaust. Remnants of the murdered civilization of Eastern European Jewry. Frozen in time behind the Iron Curtain for a half a century during the communist era. Since then, I've been exploring remote corners of Eastern and Western Europe and the former Soviet Union, where millions have been murdered in modern times. It's affected me. A sadness still lingers in these places where so many men, women, and children were murdered, systematically slaughtered, when predators using myth amplified by media to incite rage in crowds for power caused, caused modern societies to implode. America is now at risk and in the crosshairs of a perfect storm its cause is not politics, but scale. The inhuman scale of the modern cities in which we now live is rapidly dehumanizing and addicting a frighteningly large segment of the American population. Many Americans are now trapped in a vicious cycle of addiction to modern life. Just like alcoholics, something goes terribly wrong with their self-protective instincts. Just like alcoholics, they can self-destruct. Their lives are controlled by their cravings. They choose feeling good over being safe, no matter what the cost. Each of you probably know families whose lives have been torn apart by addiction. These are often wonderful families, stable, loving, educated, kind. And when their addicted family member is sober, they can be the nicest person in the world. But when they are drunk or high, they rage. They lie, they steal, they manipulate, they destroy themselves and everyone around them with no remorse and can't help themselves. Worse yet, addiction often permanently destroys the self-protective instincts of the addict. They can be sober for decades, have one drink, and be right back in the grip of full-blown addiction. Until a family leans in faces addiction head on, and learns tough love. Families spiral out of control. America is now like a big family with millions of alcoholics. America, the American family is now spiraling out of control. It's time for tough love. The inhuman scale of modern life makes us numb. We're surrounded by people, but feel anonymous. We experience profound meaninglessness. We lose touch with who we are. Modern cities make our lives efficient and powerful, yet inside we feel pain and powerlessness. Sadly, many become trapped in a prison of addiction, a prison of their own making. They attempt to self-medicate their inner pain and powerlessness with constant stimulation and endless distraction, the very things that numb and dehumanize them in the first place. But this perfect storm is so much more dangerous than we realize because at the very moment that inhuman scale is transforming America into a nation of addicts, scale is paralyzing America's immune system, checks and balances that have protected America from tyranny and, 
and political extremes for over 200 years aren't working. The country's survival is teetering on a dangerous demographic edge because so many American voters are unwittingly addicted and self-destructive just when checks and balances are no longer keeping us safe. Now I want to worry you even more. ER docs routinely confront predators, the Bernie Madoffs of the world, people who have a pathologic absence of conscience and who prey upon the vulnerabilities of others with absolutely no remorse. ER docs ask probing questions and develop a finely tuned BS meter to identify and stop child abusers, elder abusers, drug seekers, con artists. We care for uh, rapists, murderers, arsonists, and other very dangerous people. We may literally provide medical care for a child abuser in one room and a two-year-old with a toy bead stuck in their ear in the next. At times we're fierce and at times we're kind. We're very sober about the dark side of human nature without being dark. We're not ashamed for having healthy self-protective instincts. Using a diabolical scheme invented on the streets of Paris 125 years ago during the Dreyfus Affair, only two years after the birth of mass media itself. Predators shamelessly deploy myth amplified by media to create rage in crowds for power. Rage is a highly ad addictive drug that many who are addicted to modern life crave be to self-medicate their pain and powerlessness and to make them feel alive. Predators like drug dealers dispense the drug of rage to addicts who self-medicate the pain and powerlessness caused by the inhuman scale of life in modern cities. This scheme is so potent that predators can ignite mass movements that become powerful constituencies of rage. When checks and balances don't work, there's nothing to stop predators from transforming people into weapons of mass destruction and setting a society on fire. This scheme invented on the streets of Paris in the 1890s is nothing more than a formula to create anarchy. Predators focus the crowd's rage on an arbitrary demon, usually a vulnerable minority like Jews, uh, Rwandan Tutsis, Bosnian Muslims, but it could be anything including your business. Next, they convince the enraged crowd that they've been maliciously victimized by the imaginary demon singled out by the predator. The predator then lights the fuse by calling for revenge. Mass rage explodes into mass violence. This evil scheme has caused the brutal murder of millions in modern times. America is not too big to fail. Until now, checks and balances have shielded America from extreme danger of media incitement, but not anymore. Predators are now setting America on fire with impunity. Media incitement and addiction to modern life is as dangerous to your business as it is to the country. Productivity, sales, customer service, employee loyalty, innovation and competitiveness are all diminished. Addiction is costing business billions. Media incitement is now on the rise because smartphones, social media, and the internet have handed predators the, the tools they need to precisely measure, monitor, and manipulate the cravings and fears of uh, addicted masses as if they're lab rats. Predators have never before had so much power to shamelessly incite rage in crowds and set America on fire. Predators have become super predators and pay no price for their shamelessness. Perhaps some assume I'm, I'm criticizing President Trump and the right, and others assume I'm shame, slamming the left. But media incitement has nothing to do with right or left. It's not about legitimate grievances, meaningful ideas, or solving real problems. It's information engineered to anger and has almost nothing to do with the truth. Media incitement is no more than a diabolical scheme to overwhelm, con overwhelm conscience, seize power, and tear civilized societies apart from inside out before they know what hit them. It's just a technique used by dangerous predators without conscience who will stop at nothing to take power. In the era of Google, Facebook, and Twitter, anarchy has come to America. 
Most don't see it, and most don't know what to do. America is facing a massive human emergency because the inhuman scale of life is so addicting, so dehumanizing, so toxic to conscience. We need a crash course in how to remain human in an inhuman world and fast. For business, this human emergency is both an existential threat and an exceptionally powerful business opportunity. If business leaders understand how to make their workforces and their customers feel human, look at Southwest Airlines. I'm now on a mission to help businesses restore a human scale by helping them acquire situational awareness about dehumanization and to learn new critical thinking skills about managing addiction to modern life, something like we do in the ER, in their workforce. After experiencing the aftermath of so much death and evil, I wanted to know what went wrong in countries overtaken by genocide and what the American founders got right. I realized that the genius of the American founders was about scale, a human scale. They created not only a country but a way of life where it's generally safe to be human, a country where we can be different without killing each other, a country where humans will always be perfect, or, or a country that will always be imperfect because human beings are always imperfect, a country with checks and balances capable of moderating extremes and reigning in the dark side of human nature while allowing individual freedom and conscience to flourish. When checks and balances work, America works. When checks and balances don't work, predators run wild. It's like the inmates are running the asylum. Political correctness is a predator's dream. They conceal their pathologic lack of conscience behind the synthetic humanness that is political correctness. Predators win when there's no price to pay for shamelessness. And people of conscience don't stand a chance. What screwed everything up is that America has been on a hundred year drunk. Intoxicated by magical thinking about human nature coming right out of World War I. We've been stuck in 1919 and don't know it. Since 1919, we've been cut off from reality, cut off from checks and balances, cut off from ourselves, and cut off from each other. And it's eating our lunch. A hundred years ago, President Woodrow Wilson promised a wounded world, even then dangerously addicted to modern life, which had just marched blindly into the meat grinder of World War I, that a bold new reality would save mankind forever. He proclaimed that a new era in human history had dawned and called on people to place blind faith in progress as a moral force that now had the power to permanently eradicate evil by perfecting human nature itself. He told the world that World War I was the war to end all wars. Wilson uplifted societies which were on the verge of civilizational collapse by convincing them that perfection of human nature was not only possible, but was the new standard for the new age. It didn't matter that Wilson's myths about human nature were pure fantasy. They felt so incredibly good that people became drunk on magical thinking. We've been drinking Wilson's Kool-Aid ever since. A hundred years ago, people addicted to modern life chose feeling good over being safe. Who needs checks and balances in a world where you believe that modern science will permanently eradicate evil? We've been playing Russian roulette with the dark side of human nature for a hundred years. Tens of millions have died since World War I and what has been the bloodiest hundred years in human history. Many still embrace President Wilson's impossible standard of perfection because it feels beautiful and morally superior but self-loathing has now replaced self-confidence. American business is trying to compete in a world marketplace with one hand tied behind its back because so many Americans are ashamed of being American and are conflicted about winning. We hate ourselves because no matter how hard we try, we're still mortal, we're still imperfect, we're still human. Since World War I, we have been at war with ourselves and don't know why. This is why. 
To understand the dangers of inhuman scale and addiction to modern life, it helps to know a little bit about World War I. Modern cities had been around for about 40 years when the world went to war in 1914. Highly educated modern people on both sides marched enthusiastically into a meat grinder that was right before their eyes. The dazzling scale of modern city life had blinded them to the danger staring them in the face. They were cocky, addicted, and blind, but they didn't know they were cocky, addicted, and blind. Have you ever heard of August mania? In early August 1914, at the outbreak of war, huge numbers on both sides were marching in the, in the streets drunk with excitement. They saw World War I as a religious experience that would break through modern numbness, medicate modern meaninglessness, and reconnect them to their inner lives by bonding with their countrymen around a noble cause. They all thought they'd be home by Christmas, but by Christmas, a million were dead, and there was no end in sight. They were trapped with no way out in the world's first modern mass destruction. The playbook of media incitement, then only 20 years old, mobilized millions of people in neighboring countries who didn't really have a beef with one another to kill each other by the millions for no good reason. The world was shocked to discover that the wonders of modern progress had a dark side. The very same technologies that made life in cities so powerful, so exhilarating, so efficient, were capable of destroying civilization on a scale beyond anything anyone could imagine. When the inhuman scale of technology is allowed to reign without checks and balances, the genie of modern mass destruction comes out of the bottle and destroys everything in sight. It sounds like science fiction, but it really happened. If we place blind faith in modern progress and fail to remain human while living in environments of inhuman scale, we're toast. On average, over a million high-tech shells were fired every day for four and a half years. If you were in proximity to where one of these shells landed, you wouldn't just die. You would disappear instantaneously. There was a term called pink mist, which described all that was left of a human being in the kill zone of one of these weapons. When the dark side of progress transformed the surface of the earth into a living hell, armies on both sides went underground for safety, the only places where the powerful shells could not reach them. Here the soldiers recreated a human world. With thousands of messages to the future, notes to loved ones, This is uh, H.R. Marbury from Fort Worth, Texas. Mm -hmm. And beautiful works of art that reveal their inner lives while facing the world's first modern mass destruction. This man is, uh, this soldier, is thinking of America, and he has a tear under his eye. He's missing home. At any given time, tens of thousands of soldiers on both sides lived in modern underground cities beneath the trenches. Now frozen in time in complete darkness beneath private farms along the former Western Front, they had rail lines, telecommunications, electric lights, food and sanitation systems, hospitals, theaters, chapels. Living quarters, street signs, this says, to the trenches, even US mail. 
The largest underground city I photographed was over 25 miles in one place underground. They're like subway stations that go on and on and on. Until 2014, when National Geographic featured my photographs of this hidden world of World War I, it was all but unknown. When witnessing the emotions left on these walls by soldiers facing the world's first modern mass destruction, it's as if, the, it's as if they're begging us to get sober about our addiction to modern life and to open our eyes to the danger of inhuman scale. There is realistic hope. It's in this room right now. It's inside almost all of us. There's a vast reservoir of human decency and goodness that lies just beneath the surface of modern life. We experience it in these incredible moments of clarity about what really matters in life when ordinary people run headlong into extreme danger to save the lives of others. It might be a terror attack, an accident, a natural disaster, a fire. In these moments, the power of the modern world vanishes. All we have left is each other. During crisis, this reservoir of decency surfaces in a heartbeat. Complete strangers risk their lives to save the lives of complete strangers. These unselfish acts of, of altruism and courage have nothing to do with how smart or well-educated we are. They have nothing to do with race, gender, class, or culture. These heroic deeds are not ideas, they're actions. They don't come from here. They come from here. Despite all the ways modern life dehumanizes us, this vast reservoir of human decency remains an extremely powerful force of good in modern life. How do we harness it day in, day out, when there's not a crisis? That's just what happens when we restore a human scale in our families, our communities, our companies, our country. It's not a pipe dream, it's real, it works. Restoring a human scale is absolutely critical to our survival. I'm convinced that the polarization and division that is tearing America apart is not right versus left, but a battle between magical thinking versus what's humanly real. It's a battle between those addicted to modern life, manipulated by predators, inciting rage for power, versus people of conscience whose politics are as different as night and day, right, left, and middle. It's a battle between constituencies of rage with pathologically absent self-protective instincts versus constituencies of conscience with intact, healthy self-protective instincts. Business is on the front line of this battle because so many in the workforce are addicted. Businesses that learn to restore a human scale win big. Human scale unleashes human power, the power to thrive in chaos and the power to make customers and employees fall in love with your company. America, with all its flaws, is our way back home to humanness. To get back home, we must get sober about the dark side of human nature. We must relearn that healthy self-protective instincts are healthy. We must not be ashamed of practicing tough love when appropriate. If we fail to restore a human scale to modern life, America's future looks grim. The good news is that the timeless principles about human nature which make America, America, contain everything we need to save ourselves from ourselves. But we must get unstuck from 1919 and must get over the 100-year drunk and fast. As we hurtle towards a time when robots and artificial intelligence increasingly seduce people addicted to modern life to choose feeling good <coughs> over being safe, America could, could very easily reach a point of no return, which we won't recognize until it's too late. We desperately need a new American revival, which means checks and balances for the 21st century that work. And if we do this, and we can do this, we will be fine. So in closing, I implore you to wake up every day and see past what is modern what is human. And please remember, when the lights go out, all we have left is each other. Thank you.